past, you might find that somebody who was your student suddenly becomes your boss student under that person. So you never know. I will make preliminary comments before I get to a few things I want to say here. My presentation here is very long and it's a presentation that would have been more beneficial to students in research who are starting out in research for you students. But uh, I have looked at uh, the audience here. A good number of us are basically lecturers who are supervisors, and there are very few police students sitting in our midst. But before I go down to this, please, members of uh, the household of Rongo University, allow me to plead with you to love yourselves. No one outside here will love you more than you love yourselves. It is you to put Rongo University where Rongo is supposed to be, either through your students or through in the manner in which you transact your own social and intellectual business out there. The reason why I have been compelled to make that statement is that coming here this morning, this is my second time interacting with Rongo University. Uh, coming here this morning, I had expected to see <laughs> a bigger number in terms of audience than this for a conference of this character. I expect to see more students uh, than what I'm seeing. It means that uh, perhaps either we don't love what we are engaged in as a university, or we didn't do sufficient marketing, or the process began way too late. And therefore, there's no proof of mobilization for purposes of audience. Uh, in terms of uh, research, allow me to say this, that the students that we have before us, I'm saying this because I have, it, I mean, in my judgment, what I'm seeing before me are uh, people who are into some vision of students. But there's something we must remember first before I get to this. That those of us who in, are into the business of the business of supervising students. Supervising students. Let us always remember that uh, when a student is doing research under you as a supervisor. Uh, something usually happens when they finally write their proposals or write their dissertations or thesis. And somewhere within the first few pages, there's what they call the name of the student right on the first page. And then somewhere in the pages down the side, they also have the name of the student up there and the supervisors, which means all the names that are occurring in that document, indeed plus the defense panel on that document. In future, when something happens and there's an interrogation of the document, it must be determined in terms of who supervised the student, who approved the document, and who sat hearing the defense of that document that finally led to the graduation of the student. So that, when a student is writing a research document and your supervisor, one, remember that you are also part of the research and your reputation as a supervisor, as a researcher, is inextricably tied to that document for as long as that document is. The question is, when you're permitting such a document to proceed to defense or to produce to any form of interrogation, are you satisfied that adequate work or a survey work has been done on the document? Are you satisfied? I have been in situations in defense panels where students are defending, and uh, you look at the document and you look at the colleagues that are in the document, and you wonder exactly whether indeed the fellow went through the document, or the fellows in the document went through the document. 
you look all the way from the title, you look all the way to the abstract, you go to the background information, you go to the objectives, you go all the way, and even to the methodology, and everywhere. And you're asking yourself, did what, I mean, this document and the fellows that I'm seeing here as supervisors, did they really read the document? The question is, were the supervisors available for the students? Because we're living in, also in a system where people really want to publish, want to have papers under themselves, want to supervise for the purposes of promotion. So they don't mind for as long as they can say, I supervise so and so and so, and the main requirement from promotion is three, four students to become senior, to become professor. They're only looking at the numbers, they're only looking at the quality of labor that goes into the research that's being presented. The other thing I was observed, a situation where a student is stands before a defense council or a defense panel or some headroom as it were, and the student is stuck, completely being unable to answer questions, and the advice are quiet. If you have been to some of these civil jurisdictions, uh, there is what you call I don't know, they would call pre-defense. In a pre-defense, the supervisors have an opportunity to determine whether the document and the student arrive to proceed before the main and headwind. So that you don't allow your student to proceed to go and embarrass you when you're quiet, the student is quiet, when the student is not ready for that exercise. So it's also, it's also a security measure that the student does not go on to the next level before the supervisors and the panel so considered as the pre-defense are satisfied that that is supposed to be the case. In terms of structure, in terms of depth, in terms of breadth, is the document sufficient to proceed? Number two, that they shouldn't have sufficient mastery to stand before a defense council to present what they're supposed to present without embarrassing the students. So usually when the students are that quiet, then the supervisor will say, during the time for making a decision that the student is uncooperative because they're running away from responsibility. This student that you've had for the last two years, for the, for the last three years, or for the five years for people doing PhD, how can it be that suddenly on the defense day you are presenting a student before the panel that has been largely uncooperative? Where are the checks? Where are the controls? Why do we allow this? Lastly, do we, are we available for our students? Are we available for students? Number two, in terms of availability, because there's, there's, there's a difference between being present and being available. Somebody can be very present but unav unavailable. Mm. Somebody can be very present and unavailable. Attendance is good, but there's something about attendance, about being present and being available. A few minutes ago before we went for the health break, some of us who may have woken up in the morning and just rushed out taking breakfast. And you are used to taking a breakfast at nine. And we are 10.30 to 11 to 11, and you haven't taken breakfast. And you are here, and the presentation is going on here. You look here, and most times you're looking down there and wondering, when are we going to be allowed to go for the health break, for the breakfast? That person will have been present here, but are they available? Are they available? No. So you may be present as supervisor. You're present in terms of your name being in a document. You're present in terms of being having been assigned to a to be a student. But are you available for the student? Are you, are you doing the oversight role as supervisor that you're supposed to do? Are you really doing it? I plead with us, those of us who are into supervision, if you ever have a student under you as supervisor, please be available. If your name exists in a document for parts of a vision, be available. Number two, be friendly to the students. I said something uh, earlier, and I said, being a student is not leprosy. All of us sitting here, we have come this far, we have come because of men and women who allowed us to use their shoulders to climb and arrive here. If you have been given an opportunity to stand on somebody's shoulder until you've been able to get this far, 
please, if time calls on you to provide a shelter for a student and you've agreed to that commitment, please be friendly and guide. Be a good mentor. That's the only way we are going to be able to sell Rongo. That's the only way we are going to have students in our departments. That's the only way you're going to have students in our programs. That's the only way. That's the only way. So that we don't become too mean in terms of time. We don't become too mean in terms of personality as we address the issues of vision. In this regard, this is, was meant to be a very long presentation. But I am only going to do two parts. I'm going to do the search process and uh, also take us through what are designed to be the components of a search proposal. Because I designed this thing here to be basically beneficial to our postgraduate students. But because we're all here as advisors, it will also help in terms of knowing what goes where and what information to expect at what point. Please kindly give me the first uh, next page, please on research. There are several definitions that are given for what a research is. And research is basically meant to be able to seal an existing gap. Research basically means search for knowledge. But why would you want to search for that knowledge? We have several definitions here. All of them basically mean the same thing. The first one is being a cone system for applying different approaches and methods for answering questions during the learning process. It will also be a search knowledge a systematic investigation of facts about a phenomenon or a process of interest. That's also research. It's also a systematic uh, investigative process employed to increase or revise knowledge by discovering facts. Something you might need to know something more about. A systematic investigation. Systematic basically means a logical flow of process that then leads to a process where conclusion where knowledge is increased or something revised for discovering facts. A voyage of discovery and a formal adherence, I mean within the context of formal adherence to well-defined systems in order to contribute knowledge by either discovering new facts or correcting old ones. in advancing knowledge. And then we also have what you call career search. The first one is basic, and the, one, the other one is applied. In basic search, basically, just for knowledge sake. Just to increase knowledge, increase awareness. Then there's also a research where you are using the knowledge to be able to come up with new ways of doing things, come up with new products, or come up with new discoveries. The such problem. This is an area of concern, something that interests you. A gap in the existing knowledge or a deviation in the norm that points the need for further understanding and investigation. What is it you're looking for about the phenomenon? What is it that you want to understand? What is it that you want to correct? What is the problem that you want to solve? Is a dilemma, a relationship, or concern the understanding of the subject of inquiry? What is it? Please just move to the next one. Then, once you have a such problem, the question then is, how do you want to do it? How do you want to solve the problem? How do you want to discover or make an this discovery? What are the tools of inquiry? What are you going to assess the result of this inquiry. What's the process? Then you get to the arena of methodology. This is a specific procedure or technique used to identify, select, process, analyze information about a topic of interest. This process allows the data also to test the validity and the ability of a study. Validity is with regard to accuracy, and number two, reliability in regard to consistency. Please, before that. This one will be found there, validity, and uh, this is first the quality of being logical, factually sound, 
also, also how well have the process is, and there are several dimensions of validity. We have the construct validity, we have the content validity and predictive validity. And even on the element of liability in terms of accuracy, the reproducibility of the result of your study. Time factor across time, across items, and across observers. So time factor, consistency, and in a later consistency on measures of liability. Next, please. The purpose of research is to make discoveries, to understand things better, and in the long run, improve things or process. So the question is, when I engage in such, or writing a such topic, such problem, to what extent, please before that, to what extent does it make new discoveries? To what extent does it lend into making understanding better? To what extent does it improve things or process? Next, please. Outputs of research. Our board for here, there could be many. One, a discovering truth about something. Number two, creating or modifying or justifying a theory or model of something. This could be outputs. Your research could be to discover something about a phenomenon or about a reality. Or create or modify or justify a theory or a model of something. Or finding a good or better way of doing or implementing something, or okay, something like a program or simulation or a training course. Next, please. Catch our good research problem. One, it must be systematic and as thorough and as trustworthy as possible. Two, it has to be clearly written out a good research and with sufficient detail for readers to check things like sources of information. It must be easy to understand, it must be detailed to make reference if need be. And number two, it must be conducted within the confines of ethical considerations. Obvious approach is such is one, in the course of doing research, decide what you want to achieve. This thing that you're seeking to do, what exactly do you want to achieve? What are your aims? of the project or the research you're undertaking. What questions do you seek to answer? What do you want to solve? What do you want to explain further? What new understanding are you seeking to create? So decide what you want to achieve. Two, decide how you're going to achieve these aims. The methodology, what methods of inquiry are you going to impose to be able to use to solve the problem? What tools are you going to need? What resources are you going to need? What facilitation are you going to require? What is the budget for that process? How much time? How are you going to achieve it? Number three, do the research and analyze the results. State the conclusion recommendations. And finally, check if indeed what is started out to achieve has been reached, achieved. Please, this last note. One difficulty that sometimes you may not know exactly what you want to achieve at the outset. You may not know what you want to achieve at the outset. And that's exactly why you want to find out what this problem is. Number two, you may start out trying to solve a problem, but then in the course of doing literature review in terms of time information, in terms of assembling tools and methodologies, you realize a certain thing don't work out, and you may need to change your mind. This calls for flexibility in defining problems. Next, please. Major steps or such process. I have outlined about six of them here. There could be more. Number one is problem or question identification. Identifying a problem. This is where the stage where most of us have got problems. In my university and many of the universities I've been to, a student go through coursework, and this is something that I most seen, I've seen. In most instances, students go through coursework without the lecturers telling them that at the end of the coursework there's going to be research. So the coursework is so general 
that when the coursework is concluded, the student doesn't know exactly how to proceed from the end of the coursework. So what usually happens is that the student turns the supervisor and the supervisor to give them problems. To give them problems. Personally, I don't give problems. I don't give any of my students problems. And I'll tell you why. Anytime you give a student a problem, the problem that you give a student, you are the vision carrier. The student doesn't know where, you, where this thing is headed. Which means you will carry this student on your back, never being able to walk until the time they're defending the defense, panel, defense room. Any small problem, the student will be turning to you. So how will they proceed? The student will write an abstract, come to you and ask you to check first. Then they come and write background information, they bring you to, to you to come and check. Then they do literature review, they come to bring you to come and check. Then they do pro the objectives, they bring you to come back and check. Because you are the one who knows where this thing is headed, not the student. So the student lacks ownership of the research. So until the end. Basically, you are the one doing the research as the student writes what is he doing on the research. Because of giving problems to students. What I do is train my students on how to read a paper and identify a problem. That's what I do. I train my students on how to read a paper and see a gap. Because if the students are able to identify a problem, that you are the one to identify the problem for them, you will do it if the student survives and becomes your PhD students. You will do the pre identification at the master's level and proceed to do the same at the PhD level. And this person here, when they finally then become lecturers like we now are, they are unable to supervise. They are not sufficiently creative to train their students on how to identify and come up with the areas of research. They can't. Because all through their lives, they have been weaned, they have been babysat into this matter, in this matter of personal identification. So please, I plead with us, those of us on the vision, that we help our students to see problems, to how to get problems. Read articles and journal articles until they're able to see a gap. Even if it is in your own thesis, let the student read, understand, until they're able to see a problem. Don't give a problem to students. Unless you want to be the one studying and burning midnight oil for the student as they sit on your back. Number one, if the assignment set and parameters, select a topic that stays within the range of those parameters. But even before this, number two is the most important. Select a topic that personally interests and you're passionate to learn more about it. Not the topic that the lecturer is passionate about. Not the topic that interests the supervisor. That the topic that the student is interested in. Something they're passionate about, they don't really want to learn about. Because if these two things are lacking, this interest and passion, there will be no motivation to sustain the pressure of the search. When they get the point of collecting, they don't even know what to collect. When things become tough in the course of trying to do the search, the student will retreat because the interest wasn't theirs, it was the professor or the supervisor who was interested. Select a topic for which you can find manageable or an amount of information. A topic where you know there is enough literature that you can fall back on should things become tough. Don't go into an environment, don't ask them to go in an environment where there is no literature or scant literature. It's very difficult, that's to be, especially for the master students. It's very difficult. For PhD, you can, you can allow, allow them to try to swim. But for the masters, if a student selects a topic where there is no proper literature, and you're not able to guide the supervisor where the literature will come from. Because supervisor, you should also guide, I mean, be able to control the contours in terms of what you have to read and even, even how to read and understand. What are you looking for in this publication? When you find a publication that could be of interest to the student, okay, it is that the responsibility of the supervisor also 
to be able to help the student get literature. That's also part of the training. Okay? Because I'm sure that most of us here are, in, are, 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 are subscribed to various journals or the universe are subscribed. So if you're signing by virtue of your experience and exposure, you will have, have access to more articles or many of them that the student has. So you should be able to guide the student in terms of how to get the books, how to get the articles to read in a bit to understand and buttress their research. The other one here is be as original as possible. Stand out and avoid being too obvious. Don't engage you in writing something. It's very common with dissertations, very common, and very limited with the thesis. But she's doing something that at the end of the presentation, at the end of the presentation, the audience says, but there's nothing new here. This, this, is, this, this has been all along. OK? So avoid being too obvious. It is often important that you set a topic, a question that reflects exactly what you want to pursue. Please, on this part, during defense panels, I usually listen to students defend. And at the end, if I want to know if the student really understood what they were searching, I ask the question. From this presentation, what is the singular most important communication that you want this panel to carry home as they leave the defense panel room? Then the student will flip again, poop, 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 back to objectives and read for you the general objective. Then I'll tell you, that one I had read. I also read the specific objectives. As you do did this, among the many problems that you are solving, what is the singular most important agenda that as this panel lives here, you want them to carry home? That one will tell me two things. Number one, if you really were invested in research, and number two, if you really did the research yourself. Because we're also living in, in a moment where there's a lot of academic writing happening around. Our defense panels are not being able to determine whether or not this document here was written for the students to coach through the presentation and are basically trying to present somebody else's work. So you should also have learn to ask questions in defense rooms that also are able to distinguish or discriminate students who are coping from other people having their results written for them or they really did the research. And that will happen if the student sat properly well in step one. If somebody else identified the problem for them, that kind of thing is very easy to catch, even in this era of chat GPT. <laughs> even in this era of chat GPT, it is still possible, because we can be challengeful. All you need to do in chat GPT is to put a topic of research and then generate the entire thing and they copy and they give it to you. And because you also look at the language, you also look at everything else, and you're impressed. And you're asking very easy questions, questions that are border on format, that are border on grammar, that border on pagination, that border on font style, that border on so many other things. You are not able to catch a student that basically represents somebody else's work or plagiarizing. And so we produce so many people out here having master PhDs that they don't know nothing about because they know how the defense is going to play out. Next, please, step two. Planning the research in terms of information needed, materials needed, and the evaluation of those sources. Plan the research. How are you going to do it? Which articles are going to require? Whom do you need to consult? What tools are you going to require here? What such design is your research going to take? Is it going to be a qualitative research? Is it going to be a quantitative research? Or a mixed design kind of research? Is it going to be a case study kind of research? Is it going to be an independent kind of research? Is it going to be a longitudinal kind of research? Is it going to be a cross-sectional kind of research? What kind of research is it that you intend to take? And this is the second third part here. Designing the research. What design? are you going to be able to use, to be able to bring out what to bring, what to bring out? And that one will happen. You'll find this stage fairly easy, because this is the stage that determines 
the tools, the kind of data collection you're going to, the information you want to collect in terms of data, the method of analysis, and even the interpretation, and what you're going to be testing, what relationships you're going to be testing you know, at the other stage. So you decide whether the, you're going to be doing qualitative research or mixed. And what are you going to be, how are you going to be analyzing your qualitative research, how are you going to be analyzing your qualitative research, and that kind of stuff. What are you going to be seeing? You see. Number four, please. There should be number four. Just go down. Proceed. Conducting the research in terms of the research methodology that you have been able to uh, come up with. Please, the reason why that last part, that third part is very important is because it is the one that you control even the quality of data you're going to collect. Is the data you're going to collect going to be able to answer the questions that you've set? Collecting data. What data are you going to collect? What tools are you going to use to collect that data? If it is qualitative, what tools? If it is quantitative, what tools? Once you collect that data, the question then is, how are you going to analyze this data? What tools are you going to bring to bear on the qualitative data? What tools are you going to bring to bear on the quantitative data? And this part, I also encourage that if you're a student that's taking research, and it's such that at some point you're going to have to analyze data, please don't just surrender the process of analyzing data to a third party, and all you're waiting for are results. Whether it is SPSS, whether it is R, whether it is Tata, whether it is eViews, whether it is MoneyTab, whichever platform it is, don't just surrender the process of data to somebody else. And all you're waiting for are results in terms of the significance and whether you want to suggest questions or not. That's all you're waiting for. And when questions are not be the questions begin to be asked around the data analysis. You are never proceed because you are not there when the coding was being done. You are not there when the relationship was being tested. All you have are the results and perhaps the interpretations. And sometimes if that happens, you can't even discuss the data. In most of our documents that I've seen, you find our students report very well on the data res analysis results, reporting but they are unable to discuss the results. There's a difference between the results reporting and discussing the results. What do the results mean in the context of the objectives that were set? What do the results mean? What do they say about the phenomenon? So please, I say and I recommend that let us encourage our students and those of us who say that you do not surrender the data collection, I mean the data, uh, data collection, of course, and even the process of data analysis, that without you being able to understand the why of what was done, what tests were done, why was that test necessary, what did do with the result of that test really communicate in the context of what you are pursuing? Then number five, a data interpretation. Although this one has to do with uh, the results of uh, set number four, and then finally reporting what you have been able to gather from the process. These are the six critical steps in the search process. Next, please. The last part here is uh, basically to do the components of a search proposal. I'll, I'll move here very fast. And what is a search proposal? What I have here is in the, mostly in the context of, of academic search proposal, because there could be all manner of proposals. Okay. A test proposal basically is a statement of intent. What do you want to, what do you propose to do? What do you propose to do? Why do you want to do it? How do you want to do it? And what do the results mean? 
So such proposal is a plan showing a step-by-step -step description of how a proposed search will be undertaken. It reflects on such understanding of the problem and ability to collect, to conduct the research. It's a document that tells the department or tells the supervisor, whoever it is, whether you've understood the area people they want to search in, and number two, whether you also have the capacity to do it. Because sometimes a student presents something before you, they're talking about something, telling them, go and put something down. And all they want to do is always come before you orally and talk to you. It is this document that when presented before you have to review it, you are able to determine where well, this student has gathered nothing much about this area and are basically just doing what has been done, this document. It will also help you to understand or know whether the student has got the capacity in terms of even, uh, in, uh, even cost preparedness of undertaking the side they are proposing to undertake. Otherwise, you'll have a student before you who will never finish because they took something that was too bigger than them beyond their capacity. Why a such proposal? It gives an opportunity to think through your project carefully and clarify and define what you want to search. That's the opportunity. Number two, provides an outline and a guide and guides you through the research process. Especially individually, you know what you're going to be doing, how you're going to be doing it, the tool you're going to be doing, and what you're supposed to be doing in, from step to step. Number three, is so let supervisor and department know what you would like to search and how to plan to go about. This part here is very important, and the last part. In this part, this last two parts, and the last part, let the department choose a supervisor that helps the department or even members of the faculty determine who is fit to supervise the student. Please, I discourage a situation where people just have their names of on such documents just because they want promotion. I've addressed myself to that one before. Because if you have an appropriate supervisor, you'll never finish. You'll never finish. And it's also very easy to pick out a supervisor who did not actually participate in the research of the student during defense. During defense. It's also very, 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 also very easy to pick out those sorts of supervisors. <laughs> One, when the student is stuck and the chair of defense is asking the panel, I mean the part of, I mean the one of the supervisors to comment on where they're stuck. They'll never say anything. I was in university during the day when I took my PhD, where during the defense, the student sits in the middle, facing the entire audience, one supervisor on the left and that supervisor in the, on the right. What does it indicate? It means all the guys who are sitting there, the three of them, are responsible for the, the, out, the research and the outcomes thereof. And when this student with the principal investigator in this matter gets stuck, it's expected that one of the members of the panel here should be able to comment or something. The students will try it as much as they can, but these fellows here are expected also to provide clarity where the clarity is sought. So if you don't participate in the process, how will you? How will you? I also advise that Please, if you know that the student is doing a search in an area where you have little understanding, please don't allow yourself to be involved in that process. Don't allow yourself to be in that process. One, you'll be a liability to the student, and number two, you'll also be a liability even to yourself, even to your own self. Because one day when somebody picks the research, and somewhere on, on in most of us there's what you call affiliation, isn't it? And as you present your papers to the auditors, there's something called affiliation. Somebody knows, or so and so came from Long University, peer box, blah, blah. And they write to you, or they call you on phone, sir, please. Uh, there's something I'm reading in this paper here that uh, you guys did, and I'm not uh, really uh, understanding something here. Then uh, you either hang up, or say you're very busy, and then from there, uh, blacklist the number and therefore being unable to pick any unknown number because you fear that the person that you blocked before might be calling again. 
please, if you know you, that this is doing as such in an A, you don't understand. Recuse yourself. Let that position be taken up by a, company, a more competent colleague. It is not a weakness. It's only being fair to the students. So these are some of the things that uh, communicate the importance of writing a such proposal. Please, let's move to the next one. Qualities of a good research proposal. Number one, a research proposal should be detailed. It should give as much information as it can about that area. The area in which you are taking your interest to do a, a, a research. If you are taking yourself to solve a problem, you should be as detailed as you can. Number two, should mention the methods you are going to use for achieving the objective set. Should be very clear and defend those methods. Should be able to explain why these methods are suitable for the attainment of the set objectives. Why those methods? Why? Why the kind of design? Why those tools? The other one is should set out reasonable argument to support every point of view, especially, especially in the um, one background information and uh, also the problem statement and significance. Should be able to set out reasonable arguments that will support every point of view. Next, please. So these are the aspects of the development process, choosing a topic, narrowing uh, your focus to the topic, formulating your such objectives or questions, outlining key literature in the topic area, describing the methodology, including the such designs and methods, proposing approach data analysis or experiment simulation, developing a project service, a work plan and budget, if need be, and also the element of referencing or bibliography. Next, please. The general format. In most such as please, uh, okay. We have the title, we have the abstract. In most in most such proposals, these components there should be provided. In most of them. That justification could also be significant of the study. So we have the title, we have the abstract, we have the introduction which carries the objectives, the general objectives, the specific objectives, the problem statement and justification, literature review. Methodology, ethical considerations, limitation constraints, work plan or chart, budget and references. Let's move on. Title page. Title page will have contained the proposal for the title for the proposal search title, the department of supervisors, if applicable, and your name, reg number, and course. A good title accompany the following goals. One, a good title should predict the content of the paper. In writing a title for the project or for the research thesis, a good title should be able to give a proper clue into what the paper obtains. Should be as specific as possible to be able to give, uh, communicate what the research is all about. A good title should be also be interesting to the reader. Make your title also captivating. Should also interest the reader, whatever you're trying to do. It also should reflect the tone of the writing. Should contain keywords or important keywords that will make it easier to locate during the keyword search. These are components that should govern a good title. Next, please. Introduction background information. What goes in there? What's supposed to go into the introduction and background information? In some cases, I have seen students basically have a background information that mirrors the same thing, a literature review. They don't know exactly what uh, background information is all about. So that background information, that if you're reading it, all you see is literature review. The information you find under background information here, even the first part is something that you find. It. The back version is supposed to give context of your study. What's the context of that study? This study that you're going to doing, what's the constant schedule that is lying upon? State why you chose the topic area. What prompted your interest? 
and how relevant it is in terms of focusing on to the specific problem that you are you just chosen. So context of the study is supposed to give background information in terms of the general context of the search area, state why the topic interests you, and what prompted your interest in the topic area. Then we have the problem statement, we have such objectives under that problem statement, under that uh, background information. We have justification, in such questions where applicable, and uh, I put where also applicable. I say where applicable because in some cases, some situations, there are intuitions or organizations require that when writing a such proposal, then once you write the objectives, you don't need such questions. Or once you have such questions, you need objectives. Or they'll be expressing the such objectives in terms of questions. And depending on whether it's actually require test or hypothesis or not, then you may have a hypothesis at the back information. Next, please. In abstract. An abstract is a condensed version of a longer piece of writing that highlights major points covered and concise describe the content and scope of the writing. And review the writing contents in short form. The importance of an abstract. It helps the reader to decide if they should read the entire article. Number two, it helps the reader and judges remember the key findings on a topic, especially if you want to decide whether you, you should read or not. If you have a going through literature review and you want to decide which papers do I read, which do I not read, is this the point? So research, uh, an abstract is written in such a way that it should be headed to uh, decide whether they read the topic, the article, or help the reader and such as remember the key findings of a topic, helps the reader understand the text by outlining key points to read in the full document. And number the last one is for indexing for quick recovery and cross referencing. Key elements of an abstract. When an abstract has been written, especially this one now for our supervisors, having given that part of the importance of an abstract, what then should go into it? Because we agree that an abstract is a condensed version of the entire article. An abstract should have a background. That content you're talking about, a simple opening sentence or two, placing the work in context. In most documents I've seen, they just start, this work, the project aims, no context. They go straight to the objectives. The project aims, or the search was to do blah, blah, blah. The aim of this was blah, blah, without background information. There should be a sentence or two, or a communication, providing the context or the background of your search. Number two is one or two sentences giving the purpose of the work. That one should be resident, that same abstract. The other thing that should be, should be easily picked out from that abstract is the methods that have been used to do what has been done, or that will be used, if it's like proposal. A few is done here for a thesis, and will be for a proposal, okay? So, the methods that will be used to achieve, or that was used to achieve what has been achieved. The, number, the other one is the results. The results for a thesis, but expected results for a proposal. What do you anticipate? What do you foresee? Even as you do what you do. What should the reader expect when this thing finally comes to an end? What should they expect that will like the outcome of this process, process for a proposal? And what are the results that have been achieved for a thesis? Then lastly is a conclusion giving the most important consequence of the work and what the results mean. This part might not be there for a proposal, but it must be there for a thesis. Because at the thesis, now you've done everything, and you give it the most important consequence of the work. In a proposal, you end up at the further results for the for, for, and what they might mean for a proposal. Next, please. Key questions and abstracts is supposed to answer. Why are you intending to do this research? Why do you do this study or project? Or why are you undertaking the study? What did you do and how? That is on the thesis. What will you do and how for the proposal? What did you find for the thesis? What do you expect to find for the proposal? 
what do the findings mean for the thesis? These are questions that should really be answered from your abstract. And that's why an abstract determines whether the person reading the abstract should proceed to the main article or not. Depending on how, if you find your ab the article not attracting enough leadership, usually the culprit is the abstract. The document can be very important, but the signboard that shows people that they should be reading it, what should market it, has not marketed sufficiently. So people should keep on passing it. Even though it contains very good information, some that people should read, but we're not going to it because the abstract phase has not been handled properly. Next, please. Significance or justification of the study. This responds to the following questions. When you're reading significance or justification of student work, what questions are justification supposed to respond to? What do you look for in the justification? Why is the such work important? Why? What are the implications of not doing it? If you don't do it, what then would happen? How does it link to other knowledge? And this should show in the project to other body of knowledge. And lastly, why is it important on understanding of the world? Justification. When the first uh, speaker was presenting here, he talked about things like Vision 2030, Vision 2063, as, uh, as do what? SDGs and what have you, isn't it? How does it, is it important to understanding of the world in the context of those uh, issues? That's, the other one is problem statement. A problem statement is used in such as a claim that aligns the problem addressed by the study. The same problem briefly addresses the question, what is the problem that this research seeks to address? The ultimate goal of such problem is to transform the problem into a targeted, well-defined one that can be resolved through focused research and careful decision making. Please move to the next one. Format of a problem statement. When writing a problem statement, how should it be written? In what format? How should it flow? Number one, part A is the ideal. Describe a desired goal or ideal situation. Explain how things should be. Part B, describe the reality. Describe a condition that prevents the goal or state or value part A from being achieved or realized at this time. And that's where the problem lies. What is it that prevents what you're trying to do from achieving the first day, that ideal? Then the consequences. Identify the way you propose to move the reality to the ideal, solving the problem. Identify the way you propose to improve the current situation and move it closer to the goal or the ideal. So what is required, what is, and how you're moving, what is to what is required, solving the problem. Next, please. I think this part is more uh, such objectives. That are basically, uh, we always say that such objectives are supposed to be smart. I don't want to go into all this for, because of time. Please just move forward. We're talking about objectives are supposed to be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. Uh, just move forward. The methodology. In this section, identify the methodology that pins your research and give a rationale for approach. Defend your approach. Show how you have used related review to construct your research methodology. State the strategies. Determine the design and whether or not you want to be collective or, uh, or mixed and the kind of data you're going to be uh, collecting and the tools for collection of that data. Please move forward. Just move forward. Go on. Just move forward. Please, this area here also, limitations here, identify or replace the limitations or weakness of the study. But as you write this, please be careful not to make it look like it is impossible. 
Light the weakness, yes, but also indicate how, what you're going to be doing to counter the weaknesses. Next, please. The work plan, I think that one is uh, self-explanatory. References, I think that one is self-explanatory. I think I don't want to go into this because of time. But please, let me say this about uh, NITIA review. And that's why I close uh, this presentation. I have seen in many such documents where students try to review and all they are doing is so and so did, so and so did, so and so did, so and so did, so and so did. And the entire document is full of so and so did and did the last part. Then you're wondering, is that one a real literature review? Is that a real literature review? Because a literature review is supposed to communicate to the audience that are reading your work that you are aware of the conversations and the discussions that are proceeding in that area. That you are aware of the tools that were used to produce the research. You are aware of the objectives of the research article you are reading. You are aware of the results and the mean the results. And then communicate your point of agreement, disagreement, or departure. And where your problem now comes in. Because you write, you also write with a view to creating the existing gap, revealing the existing gap from the documents, so that it places your research. Your research. But when you're writing, so and so did, so and so did. Where does, how do you, how do you place your problem? Because this review is supposed to indicate who did what, how did they do it, what assumptions could, might they have made. What is also obtained? Where do you agree? Where do you agree? And where does a problem lie? With each and every article you've read, it's not so and so did this, God results, blah, stop, move to the next one. Move, see this one, God results, blah, blah, God results this. Do you agree the results? If you don't agree, why? If some assumptions were made, in your own research, which of the assumptions are you lifting and why? So that your literature review is not supposed to be just so and so did, so and so did, so and so did. So when you're reading work that have been written by our students, let us be careful not to end up with a situation where we are only doing so and so did, so and so did. Ask. I always ask students. I always ask students that this work you present before us, of these references at the back, which author's work mainly influenced your work. What were these methods? And how distinctly different are these methods from yours? Because I also help you to know whether the works that have been cited here, this fellow actually read them or not. Because people are fond of having a long list of references that they haven't read. All they did was go to Google Scholar, pluck them and paste. They want to read. I will pick a few and ask you, in so and so's work in page this, what were the conversations? What were their results? What were their methods? Do you agree or don't agree? If you don't agree, why? That necessitates you to move to what you are trying to do. The other bit about it is the currency of the references. If you are doing a search in 2024, and the latest reference in the document is 2019, are you trying to convince the panel that uh, from 2019 up to 2024, no one has discussed or done anything in that area. Or is it that you didn't canvas literature enough? So let us also insist on currency of references, currency of literature review. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that stimulating talk. Uh, we can do better uh, to applaud and we'll do the reverse of what uh, Dr. Dero was uh, taught us. We'll start with one and go to three. I will not demonstrate, so I'll just say one. Ah, they are behind. Okay. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Uh, we are running behind schedule, and uh, we are only going to take 15 minutes to get uh, questions or comments. 
and uh, I want to open the floor for the questions or comments. I'll pick uh, Dr. Mosso will be the first one. Dr. Lal, yes, three. Uh, who else? Number four. Number five. Let us begin. Thank you. Um, Dr. Alicia, thank you for the good presentation. I'd like to summarize your presentation as supervision dilemmas that we go through as supervisors during postgraduate training because uh, your work also reminds me of somebody called Stephen Ball. I don't know whether you've read his work about how systems come up with uh, guidelines that are used to control employees to focus on what the employers want. And uh, my dilemma here is this. I remember I've referred a student, two students, one in the UK is almost finishing PhD, another one to Belgium. The student applied using a proposal. He was admitted, right? Given a scholarship, but the university told him that unfortunately you qualify, but we can't take you in because we don't have a supervisor who is qualified in your topic of what? Supervision. Now, let's come to our context. Now, in our context, when we are given these guidelines that are used to control us so that we focus on promotion, how do we move away from this? Because these systems sometimes are so powerful that even us as supervisors, we are not able to run away from them. And therefore, in most cases, you'll find lecturers going to supervise students in topics that they don't understand. It's an era of competition. And it's not only for us. Even students are in competition. They come to university for postgraduate training not to gain knowledge, but for promotion. And that is why sometimes they will not engage in this elaborate exercise of analyzing data themselves, but they'll go to a vendor and then bring the results. It's an era of competition. And we are being controlled, and we are required to work with this. My question is, um, because I think if you are able to answer this question, then we are able to, to improve postgraduate training and the quality of students that we produce. In your own opinion, how can we uh, have a safeguard that shifts our focus from these uh, co systems of control? When I say systems of control, I think you know what I mean. The guidelines that you must supervise this number of students to be promoted, those are systems of control. And now our hands are tied. We have to supervise anybody, anywhere, in order to be promoted. Thank you. Uh, my name is Francis Olal. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Musso, you have, uh, you have even taken all my questions. <laughs> because what you have said is exactly what I wanted to say, but uh, that is very good. Uh, what uh, I wanted also to just to add on what Dr. Musa has said is uh, I wish we had uh, what the presenter has said, in fact, he lamented when he was starting that he wished there were students here. Exactly that. I also wished there were students here. And uh, in fact, um, I have a case, uh, a practical case, where Moses has uh, talked. When I was doing my master's, I chose a topic. But because people wanted, uh, lecturers wanted somebody they could uh, supervise, I found supervisors who were not knowledgeable on what I was doing. And uh, in other what it is advantageous to the student and sometimes also disadvantageous. It made me go very fast because I was just 
writing, taking to them, and they, uh, they are there waiting for my explanation. Oh, okay, why did you do this? Oh, this is, oh, this is how you do these things. Yeah, it's very good, very good. Very. So, <laughs> so, so I did it very fast. Uh, and people wondered how I graduated in a record, uh, record two years for masters in Mo University, which they said was uh, unbelievable. Now, uh, I wanted to ask you questions. When you were presenting and you gave uh, steps of uh, what you expect on a proposal and a thesis, up to reco up to conclusion. Uh, I didn't see you putting recommendation. Is it a must? Or it is not a must? Again, you talked of limitations. You uh, said if you put so much of limitation, they can ask you how will you do this. What about if you decide not to put limitations? Thank you. The, the next batch of questions go directly to the questions. We are running behind schedule. Uh, uh, yes, then Nik Nakitari and then Professor Tenka. Yes, thank you. My name is Calvin Ogo, a student. Uh, my question, I have related to what Dr. Lalu is, uh, uh, talked about. You are a student and uh, you've applied for a post to be a postgraduate student in a let's say sociology. And uh, in that department, there is a, a call for paper, or a call for proposal. And this, this uh, proposal is not directly linked to your interest. And uh, the department is, is now insisting that you must line your, align your work to this particular proposal. What am I supposed to do as a student? Then, uh, then another question is, uh, how current are the references supposed to be? Because you, uh, in your last uh, statement, you talk about uh, uh, re references should be current. How current are they supposed to be? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ari. Mine is uh, just curious on the data analysis tools and most also the platforms. I think because of technology, so many tools are now at our disposal, and I'm just curious to know uh, what would you recommend? Uh, for example, if it is statistical uh, or quantitative uh, data, which tools? Uh, if it is uh, qualitative, which ones and why? Uh, maybe just an idea. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Terry. This is the area that has a lot of argument, and I wish as a conference we would have come up with something that would help some of our students who are here. Otherwise, some of the presentation would also distort. Uh, me, I have my students next to me. So if the students are not here, then those supervisors who claim to be supervisors would have worked with their students, because it was a conference which was announced. So marketing was done enough. Now, um, the presenter, uh, I would want you to help us understand justification and significant, because it seems to be a little bit. And you know, when we go back, our students are saying now in the conference, we, and there were many scholars, they said justification and significant uh, are uh, okay, stroke, significant or justification. So help us so that when we go back, we are not going to start having distorted information. Objectives and, question, and research questions. Pia would request that you help us understand because at some point you find we turn our specific to research questions. You just turn it. Otenga is working like this. Why Otenga is working? Is that what we, we, we need to as a research question? Because some of the things you needed to have really gone deep if you are going to tackle the postgraduate students who are going to apply them to develop there. So I would want to know because the tradition is that. But uh, here I'm told the research questions is stand. Uh, objective is stand research questions. So if you have three objectives, you have three questions. 
but um, some of the traditional professors will tell you no. One research objective can generate two. Then the other thing that I would want you also to help us. I, I wanted I, you to limit just to one. I didn't of see. Time. I didn't see. You know, he had a, a, um, a, const a frame. So that frame must be a frame that we are taking home. I think at the end of that, this is the only key thing that we'd have gone home with, with agreed, so that we can also review what we have. Theoretical and conceptual framework. I uh, also did not see in your po in your in your format. As social scientists, we believe on theoretical. And um, last one is the reference. We have as recent as possible, which is okay, but we have classical and we also have contemporary. So if it is a classical, do you advise our students to remove it because it is Karl Marx of that? Or how do we develop? Because we based our argument on classical then we graduate them because they make the foundation of the argument. Thank you. Those are the areas I've picked up. I, I'm going to stop the questions, unfortunately, because of time. But uh, I will request they are noted down. Uh, let uh, Dr. respond. And then uh, we see if there's time. I don't know if I can give you this. It's sounding better than... sitting but let me have this privilege once again of standing before you <laughs> uh, I have about five questions to respond to and I'll do my best to move as fast as I can so that we redeem on time the first question was on systems um, control I am aware that uh, especially the current queer regulations are extremely demanding. People really want to get promoted, people want to target. And uh, queer regulations provide a framework for what you must do to get where. That one I also understand. And there's nothing you can do about it because that is a fairly na national regulation with respect to promotions uh, and appointments in uh, higher education in institutions especially with academic staff. Uh, but having said that, uh, I would not recommend a situation where one goes into advising something just because they want promotion and certain area of the expertise. You'll contribute to the ill just have indicated. Uh, the other one way of uh, arresting this, in fact, there are two ways. One is personal. As a lecturer standing for the students, the other one is institutional or sub-institutional. I'll start with the one that's personal. In my presentation, I talked about getting into class and offering coursework to students, and more often than not, our students end up in a situation where when they finish coursework, they don't know how to proceed with research. I propose or, or in favor of a presentation in coursework where when I'm teaching a course, I am able to point my students into areas of cutting edge research. And sometimes when I'm talking to them that way, I'm also inviting them into an area where I'm also maybe having some element of expertise. So that if in the end they choose the other direction, then possibly I might be part of the supervision team for that student. And uh, I usually advise that we do not teach our position students in coursework the same way we teach undergraduate. Where they are sitting there and all they are doing is copying notes, copying notes, and waiting for cut one, cut two, exam, A, B, C, D, and they go into such. Let us teach our position students in such a way that because as you teach them, you are a potential supervisor. Even before you, the student has chosen you, you're a policy supervisor. Let us teach them in a manner that then invites them into given areas of research. As we do that, the student is able to determine who can supervise me in this area, who can supervise me in this area, which area is more interesting to me, and depending on how you're putting it. That's number one. Number two, 
is departmental faculty. When students are having come from the coursework in the manner which I've been able to prescribe, when the students write their proposals first, or they begin to talk about uh, uh, their researches, I usually do not go straight into the research proposal. There's a document that comes with research proposal and it's called concept paper. A concept paper is basically, at the very most, an 800 word document that spells out the background, the literature view, a bit of literature view, uh, the objectives, and what the students really want to search on. Then that one is shared at the faculty. The faculty will, will organize or convene a panel of people in that area, and the students will be presenting. It is in that panel that the supervisors are appointed for the students. And see, because you are a that made in a panel, you are, you are able to then have an opportunity to say, ah, that was you. that's not my, my area, that's not my area, that's my area. So you only have people who are able to competent survive the students. That on the rest, they have the appetite of just getting into a panel just because you want promotion. I think that that's, that's how I would respond to the past question. On uh, the limitations, Please, this one here is uh, an aspect of proposal that may or may not be required. But I, I usually uh, recommend that you place it just in case somebody might want to ask it, and you never contemplate it. But I usually say, as you do it, uh, you of course know that you want to get the research completion, okay? And you know there are certain constraints to the research. Okay, those are the, the threats of the limitation of the research. The question is, if somebody were to ask you in the in a panel, what are the constraints for, for your research? Do you want to talk about them in a manner that will make that impossible? No, because each and every search there has to be an, there has to be there has to be a challenge. What are the challenges that you foresee, and how do you intend to encounter them? So you may or you may not, depending on uh, your, the regulations of the graduate school in your institution in that regard. Then recommendations. Please, recommendations are very important. And you, when I talked about the pop up here, I talked about conclusion and what do, this, what do the, what the results mean or what they point to. That's the area in where you put it there is a sum, um, in a summary of the recommendations. But at the end also, you also expect to give a recommendation at the very, very end. Two things at the very end. One is a recommendation, and number two, further direction for research. They are, not, they, are not, they are not basically the same. People think they are the same. They are not. Okay? So they are recommendations and further direction for research. Important, please. Then on the issue of references, please, I did not say that if you are doing Hydro 2024, then you must never have a reference that is 1969. Because every research has got a background. You cannot be building a background for research from nonsense or from nothing. That background must come from somewhere. As far back as that background can be, let it be. But the research having been shared in 1999, things did not freeze in 1969, no matter how classical. Did not freeze then, or as far back then. In terms of such that area, how far have we come as close as we can to 2024? I'm not saying that you must kill yourself trying to get a 2024 reference. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying to say, in, are you able to demonstrate that in such of literature, in a kind of literature, you did a good work? You excavated the best you could do. Because somebody could come up in the defense and ask you, there is this paper by so and so. 2022 to 2023. Paper that's so much relevant to the age you're studying and asking questions from there, and you don't know. You don't know. You are saying you don't know. Yet, you have reference and saying your reference are very current. In your search of literature, how well have you done that search? Okay? Then, on tools of data analysis, uh, this one depends on a number of other, a number of things. One is your, 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 your upbringing, and also your task for wanting how things happen. 
More often than not in social sciences, people use SPSS. SPSS. And uh, I've seen also in such a way, perhaps somebody says, that I'll be using SPSS version 25. And the question sometimes be, if you're testing, you're talking about version 25 in the proposal, and the proposal is done in 2016, for example. And then you go all the way, and you're now doing analysis in 2024 or 2023, depending on the bottom you have faced. Would you still stick to version 25? Would you still stick to 25? Why this version? Necessary? Why don't you just say SPSS and leave it there? So that it gives room for you to navigate through whatever version that you have been current at that time. Okay, then uh, when you do whether you're doing a, a research of economics nature or whatever it is, there are people who also use data, but that depend on which one do you know. Which one do you know? If you if if you use if you're that of course that one in regard to quantitative and whether or not you've structured your questionnaire or data collection tool in such a way that even if you're doing qualitative, then there's a way in which you can transmute the qualitative into quantitative. That's also possible, depending on uh, how you distract your questionnaire. The information you're collecting, okay? Are you able to assign values that are representative of the qualitative information? If that can be possible, then you still go the direction of either SPSS or, or, or Stata or Minitab or eViews. That's what you can still do, depending which one you want. But if you are into qualitative, purely qualitative, then there are also many others. One of them that I think I'm aware of is the NVivo you really have to buy it, okay? Of course, there are many others, okay? You can also, also use, uh, you can also use uh, Excel, if you're good at it. We call it matrix content analysis within Excel, okay? It's a lot of work, but it's something that's possible. And I mean, there's also paper, and there's also, there are many, there are quite many. I wish I had time for that, there are many. But uh, NVivo is more popular depending on how that data was collected on the, and the, 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 the platform in which you did the collection of data, okay? Especially if you're going to be doing things to do it, unless the data, key form and interviews or FGDs and this kind of stuff, then you'll need either in vivo or paper or any of those other, other, other ones, but depending on the orientation that you have. The point I was making here in this regard, please, do not surrender the process data collection and data analysis to a third party without being actively involved. So that you get to know what was done, why was it done, what relationships were tested, why was it necessary to do it this way, with carrying a T test or carrying a chi test, why chi test here, why T test here, if you're doing an pattern parametric, why this, how do you test validity within the context of that, that software, how do you test liability, what test do you carry out, what am I supposed to be able to, to report in my document? Because sometimes somebody will be giving you some information for that analysis that, uh, because you don't know what, what, what came out, but they gave you something that interested them, not you. And so you report what they produced, not what you really had want to get harvested from that analysis platform. Then lastly, on the justification, no, there's a justification and uh, similar size. In my world and my experience, and uh, I don't know what the guidelines are given by Rongo Graduate School, okay? In our university, you get university where I come from, is either justification or significance. Not both. It's either one or the other, the document. And I think I mentioned what a justification is, right? And then with regard to objectives, and such questions and uh, that kind of stuff, Allow me to put it this way. It is not true that in all researches you will have such questions. Not true. As part of the proposal, not true. If you are in the field like where I am, after the objectives and the objectives, you'll basically move to those other aspects without such questions. It's such questions more popularly come in a situation where you anticipate to frame a hypothesis. If your research is in a such where you intend to go through testing or hypothesis or hypothesis, then it is the such question that we convert basically to the, so they go through objectives or research, which are then called such questions, which then translate into hypothesis. That's how I know it. Thank you.
Thank you. Another round of applause. I am sorry uh, to my two seniors that have uh, denied the opportunity because of time, but uh, Daktari is still around. I believe uh, you will be go uh, interact with him uh, during the lunch break, uh, but we want to recover the lost time that has passed by. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Daktari for that session. I think, uh, how many students were in the room? Yeah, there are quite a number. Uh, I believe we'll be able to organize another session uh, so that we can continue interacting. I want to take this opportunity to in invite Dr. Abila uh, to then come and carry this program forward, uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Uh, time has moved, and uh, we are going to the next session. Uh, we shall be moving to going for lunch, and after lunch, we shall split into two rooms for presentations. Uh, if you look at the program, we have hall, hall A and Hall B. This is going to be Hall A. Hall B will be the rumor, rumor hall. As you move out, there is uh, another hall opposite. It's called rumor. So uh, the following uh, groups will be in uh, hall, hall, hall A, uh, presentation one to six will be in Hall A here, then presentation uh, uh, 7 to 12 in this hall room, the next door. So uh, we'll still be streaming live. So uh, uh, don't worry. Uh, So if you go to the uh, successive pages, yeah, so if, if you go to successive pages, you'll see uh, where you belong, presentation one to six, then presentation one, seven to 12. So check carefully and uh, find where you fit. Uh, presentation one will be, re will be replaced by presentation 36. So let's take note. Uh, so if you need clarity, we are still available. We shall guide you. There are other announcements here. It's 38. Okay. So presentation one will be replaced with presentation 38, not 36. Uh, the other announcement to be made, then we'll break for lunch. Dr. Mondi. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bila. I just want to give some um, housekeeping announcements. Number one, the books of abstracts are already here with us, and if you have not been able to get one, please contact the Secretariat so that you are able to keep track of where and when the presentations are going to be made, as Dr. Abila has already indicated. Then number two, there are some other uh, conference materials that uh, were running late in delivery. Uh, those includes, uh, include the notebooks, the pens and the bags, as well as the tags, but we hope to get them within the day so when they arrive, we will be able to issue them out. We also invite those who have not registered to please uh, check with the Secretariat so that we can regularize our regis registration to enable us progress and proceed. 
in accordance with the plans. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, it would be also well enough just to thank uh, Dr. Tari, uh, for sharing his wonderful experience in the research process. Uh, it's very challenging. So we shall give him a mathematical uh, appreciation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tari. So we shall give him five factorial. So we'll hit five, then hit three, uh, four, then three, up to one. So let's prepare. Okay, let's give the cherry. Let's go. Bye, Patrick. Thank you. <laughs> we can move for lunch. Oh, thank you very much. The session that comes after lunch begins at 2, and so we want to request that we move with speed to catch up with the schedule.